Shouts out to Art Bay. Shouts out to Art Bay. Uh. The other girls don't understand the things I do. They don't understand the dreams I pursue. Hey, I'm Charlie Kane. Um, I work for a huge multi-retailer e-commerce brand doing their event production and experiential marketing strategies and I'm also a writer for the hundreds. I'm from Chicago, now living in Los Angeles. So if I'm like really thinking about the beginning, it would have to be like music and dance. I was a big dancer um, growing up from when I was four till about like early college years. <clears throat> and around that time in Chicago, like early 2000s, when like Kanye was breaking out, there was a big like backpacker movement in Chicago and a lot of communities came together when it came to hip hop um, and brought together a lot of like b-boy events and like dancers and like anything that had to deal with the four elements of hip hop, they would bring it into these b-boy events. So started really like getting into that. Um, again, always been an like observer of the culture and like subcultures and just like thinking how fashion relates to that because these b-boys would be so fly, like um, Nike SBs would be like the biggest thing at the moment, you know. And I coming from like the suburbs and um, I guess a background who couldn't afford these things was always just trying to make my own like style or flavor so that I could just hang, you know. Um, and that just eventually propelled into me wanting to write about these things and then studying um, like fashion journalism, but uncovering that there has been a lack of documenting what streetwear is in a more like contextual like basis and not just like these are the hottest sneakers or this is what's trending right now so really wanted to dissect more about what oh how fashion represents subcultures and what it means to people but how it's grown into event production <laughs> and it's kind of <clears throat> guess have been the direction or organic route for me because I've always been about innovation in all of my projects so if I made a zine before it had to have some kind of like tangible aspect and not just um, I guess not just reading it on paper I was always thinking about how one how I can make it analog or how I can like tie nostalgia into everything that I work with but also pushing it forward where it's like how do I want people to experience things and wanted it wanted to sell more of an experience rather than just like the product so when it came to the company I work for now um, I, I mean I worked up from the brand I started as like a copywriter and then just get kept getting promoted and then um, touched upon like their site experience and user experience and then throughout all this time when it came to like streetwear or retail in general it's been more so about how we can get people to come to these like stores and brick and mortars and now it's just all about like the experience of the store and a lot of it is fueled by Instagram and selfies and stuff and like documenting like where you're at or like how you are, um, I guess, telling your own story with your own lens when you're going to these events or stores, but it like builds a hype. So now I'm like working more towards like strategy and marketing things where we can create like experiences or events that people want to go to, that people want to like claim that, hey, we're here or I'm here. This is like really exclusive. This is my experience and in the end just like cap it with like buying something. Well I think when it comes to retail or I guess any brand who's trying to make money, the end is the product, right? You want to like seal everything with a purchase or an exchange of a transaction. Um, <clears throat> so the end goal is just making that like money transaction. And 
So in between that, you're navigating between, uh, you know, what story you want to tell, and then what was the other one you said? Experience, right? Experience. So I think the number one thing that you're selling to make it sound free is like an experience. Um, and that can be anything from building installations, like making something really cool so that you'd want to take a selfie in front of it, you know? Um, or um, it could be more of like a narrative type where you're like customizing something for yourself or you're like, I guess getting like a service from like somebody else or you're working with another brand partner like at the store. So it really is about um, when it comes to like experience, you then you're like providing it for your customer base and then the customer or the person who is um, attending creates their own narrative and that's kind of the link of how a person really like gets involved with the with the brand you know because then they start to build a tie with the brand because they're allowing them to identify with the brand through the experience that they're making because he, he definitely became an inspiration for like many people. I think he inspired people that high culture is accessible. You know, this is around the time when internet started popping and he had that infamous blog that he would just like put people on to like art things, you know. And I think during that time with Chicago, it's still very, it's still segregated, but very, very segregated at the time where people didn't feel like they could have access to these things, or they thought it was too highbrow, or like, uh, too white, I don't know. People were like afraid of it. So him introducing uh, um, artists, uh, just anything outside of what is, what was considered urban, you know, and that term is like, rest in peace, it's like dead already, you know, but um, I think giving people like that access was a huge inspiration and drive for not just Chicago, but for, for everyone. Um, and, and, you know, after that, I think people were just trying to work through their hating side, like Chicago was a big propeller on not exactly being supported. From the shy, the city you hella hated. They couldn't see yet or envision that they can be successful through like creative things. We're a very like blue collar city, um, very conservative city, and like creative things cultivated there, but people eventually would leave, you know, so that foundation would never really stick. And I think over the years, there's been like a lot of great brands and people who have just stayed in Chicago and have been able to do that and build up their brands. And now we're seeing like really strong representatives there. Um, coming from Chicago, early 90s, it was huge to just be watching Michael Jordan and the Dream Team and just Chicago Bulls during their reign. And <clears throat> his kicks were just like amazing, but I could never afford them, you know? So, um, yeah, we could never afford that. RIP Payless, because my mom was a huge like Payless buyer, and now they're, they're, they're going out of business. Um, but it's funny because I guess, um, <clears throat> so I would never have Nikes. I didn't even have Nikes until maybe I was like 18 because I was trying to keep up with the other dancers. So I finally like bought some like, it was, it was, it's like Nike Jordan. I don't know, it was Jordans, but it was, it wasn't under the Jordan brand. I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. It was definitely like, okay, sus. <laughs> But then you fast forward, and then like, I'm like dancing with or for Nike, for like Rihanna, you know, and then they like, they like swag you out. And then you fast forward again, and like, 
I'm like leading a running collective and they swag us out with Nike. But I remember there was this one particular instance when Nike was trying to do this like activation of, um, of um, connecting and interviewing women and uh, I guess connecting them with their like lifestyle brand or lifestyle shoe. And so they, I chose Hirachis because Hirachis were like the closest to me that looked like Jordans or like back in the day. So I don't know, it was just like a whole world, just like, it was a whole complete like 360. Besides like Nike and Jordan, another big brand for me that definitely like catapulted something in me is Hell's Bells. Cause that, that was probably one of the first women's brand that I got exposed to, women's streetwear brand that I got exposed to. And I was like, oh shit, like streetwear can be for like girls too, you know? And it wasn't, it wasn't pink. Um, it was like, it was raw. Like the graphic design was very like badass and like in your face, but not too in your face. It wasn't like, bitch, you know? It was just like cool, you know? <clears throat> um, and again, it took me a while to even afford something of Hell's Bells, but it was one of those moments where I'm like, wow, like a girl can do this. And, and the, the founder or the head designer is Filipino, and I'm like, that's amazing. You know? Hey, it's Charlie. The male gaze was a term that was created in film regarding what the male sees or perceives and how they're capturing or portraying women. A lot of how women were portrayed in the media were really, really concentrating on the objectification of a woman and a male perspective of what female beauty is. And I honestly think that's affected so much of how we carry ourselves for the longest time. Today we're also in this amazing time of women who are taking space in these roles and industries, redefining the female gaze within their visual works. And they're creating a new narrative, a new female gaze of how women should be portrayed. And it's about honoring the natural self and the authenticity in that and a woman's story. Girl Talk is uh a podcast dressed as a hotline number. Um, I'm always big into like nostalgia and back in the day there were things called boxes, like voicemail boxes where you had a phone number and you'd call. This is even before pagers or beepers or big. So you had like a number, you would call and like you'd leave someone a voicemail and it's pretty much telling them like, yo, it's Charlie, call, call me back, you know, and that's how you would like know that someone's trying to reach you um, but then you would have fun with it because like you call the number and the intro would always be like a song playing that someone recorded on their like cassette tape player you know and it'd be like a song playing a little like the first three bars and then it'd be like hey what's up this is Charlie <laughs> it's the greatest thing so with Girl Talk, like I wanted to create something just like that. Um, I really, I wanted people to really listen. Um, there's a lot of like layers to Girl Talk. So the hotline number itself is, I really wanted people to listen, not having them the ability to like fast forward something, but like you really had to sit there and listen throughout the whole like message. Um, <clears throat> And I also just miss like talking on the phone, you know, not just like texting and not just like DMing. Like, I love hearing the sound of voices. It's, it's like everything when it comes to a conversation. You can, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't make it dry or it doesn't, it's not in your head. You literally like feel the energy of what someone is saying, depending on their like tone, you know. There's no editing. It's like real, it's raw. So it started off as me trying to write this book called Homegirl, and Homegirl was about women in streetwear. And this is probably about two to three years ago when I was trying to write this. And it was pretty much like profiles of women in streetwear. 
but asking like deeper questions about women's streetwear like um, one why isn't as like why isn't it as prominent like why why are cuts still funny when it comes to women's streetwear um, it was it was just like a lot of like deeper questions when it came to it and as well as like the industry how how it felt working in a male dominated industry etc cetera, etc cetera. but what i was finding that i was finding that it was really difficult for these women to like answer these questions i think around the time people were really looking at themselves as brands so they didn't want to like taint their brand or they didn't know if they could talk about those things because of the company that they worked for. So it was, it, or the questions were just like really deep. At the time, when it came to uh, interviews and women, it was always about like, what's your favorite sneaker? Or like, tell me about your style. Like it was very surface level questions. And I think my 10 questions of like, bam, which is like, oh, that's too much, you know? <clears throat> so, I think I, um, I hit my like breaking point when I had to interview this one photographer who's very, very known in the industry and she wanted me to edit my questions. Like, there's two rounds of editing these questions and in the end, she didn't even really like answer them and it was very, very frustrating, you know, because I'm like, I really respected this woman. Um, felt like she represented like minorities and like you could be creative and <clears throat> has have has had like a very successful career so far it's just so frustrating so I took what would be 10 questions and to be one question every month and it'd be like themed and then I would curate by asking or getting um, certain women who would fit that question so, yeah, I don't know if I really answered that. <laughs> so for this like current project that I'm working on is like creating like a mini video documentary on like female DJs. But these women are multifaceted. They're not just DJs. They've used it as a vessel to build communities or um, become designers and what have you and for this project like I am working with somebody else on it you know and it's just a small team it's just like me her and then like the Apple program director but it's been such a huge help just to have like other people on your team and it feels feels great not to be the only one who's like carrying this you know Yeah, so we're doing it for Women's History Month next month. Um, so we're, it's it's going to be like a Today at Apple, one of their series. And uh, we're going to be like premiering this video and we'll have a quick panel with two of the Chicago DJs and then a demo. Because in the end, my purpose was not only to elevate what these women are doing, but also to teach other young women or the youth to uh, create content but create it in a way where it's like, there's substance behind it, there's context behind it. So learning how to interview and asking deeper, deeper shit, you know? And not, especially when it comes to like DJs, um, one, to learn how to drop female DJs, just, there's DJs, and like two, like to take their craft seriously and what they're doing and not to continue associating them with like style and fashion, you know, like there's more to them. There's like, it's not like that with men and I don't, I don't understand why. But yeah, I just, um, for the Apple program, it's basically like elevating these women, but also elevating the youth to learn how to like ask questions and like document. Shouts out the art bay. Shouts out the art bay. The other girls don't understand the things I do They don't understand the dreams I pursue